Well, good afternoon. Uh, we're in the middle of the Dementia Awareness Week and a lot's going on, but two challenges particularly stand out this year. One is the fallout from more than a year of COVID lockdowns and the other underlying is a long-term rise in forms of dementia. Research-based and community-based solutions are both important here, but so are sometimes quite simple changes around lifestyle, diet, staying active. I'm Pete Kelly, a retired journalist supporting Age UK Norwich, and this afternoon the charity is bringing together three people working very hard in these areas. Dr Michael Gray is a reader in rehabilitation neuroscience at the University of East Anglia, who has worked in the brain injury field as an educator and researcher for more than 20 years. His research interests include developing better tests for the assessment of sports concussion, return to play, to learning and to work, and sports related neurodegeneration. Helen Burgess is content director of AgeSpace, the free online platform sharing information and advice to help families take care of elderly relatives. The site has, among much else, lots of useful guides on dementia, from recognizing the signs to getting a diagnosis to setting up a power of attorney. Dan Skipper is the CEO of Age UK Norwich, a charity running a range of community based services, which has recently reimagined its approach to offer an increasingly flexible mix of home based care and daycare for those living with dementia, alongside activity groups and advice for those living with dementia. This charity is also about to launch a summer campaign encouraging older people to enjoy getting more active post COVID. So, Michael. Perhaps we can start by asking you what you think the biggest challenge is right now in the science area. Well, I, I guess the biggest challenge will be coming up for a cure. Um, as we know, dementia is, is not a disease that currently has a cure. There are a lot of people all over the world working towards this end, but, but we're, we're many years off from, from finding that. So in the meantime, there's a significant amount of research being done now to, to look at um, if, if, we, if we can't cure dementia, what, we, what can we do to, to mitigate some of the circumstances that people find that they're in, uh, both themselves and their families. And Helen, how about from your perspective, what would you say the, the big challenge is right now? Um, I think the biggest challenge is confusion for families and carers and that they just don't know where to turn. Um, they get a diagnosis and the information they receive from the GPs just varies widely across the country. And I think um, it's bigger than just a medical diagnosis when it comes to dementia, it, it, it impacts your whole life and your future. So that comes down to the care support options you need, legal, financial, it's just wider than a medical diagnosis and people need consistent information and advice on diagnosis. Dan, how about you? Yeah, I concur with Helen really about the, um, you, can, you can probably replace the word dementia with other conditions, is that support post-diagnosis. And I think, you know, dementia strikes um, quite a lot of fear with uh, people as a condition in view of its lack of cure. So it can be very unsettling for the whole family and multi-generations of that family about their future and also about how they're going to manage the care around it, which can be different for, for many, many years. So, you know, we, we often see families, um, as, as Helen just sort of laid out, um, who contact us as a charity where they don't know what to do. They don't even know what type of dementia they might have. So all of this uncertainty can, can create a lot of worry and quite some unnecessary worry actually at a certain time. So I think it's about getting the right support at the right time for families and being there for the long journey, not just you know, certain points in the journey. It's a, it's a, it's a whole sort of um, life approach really, I think. So, I mean, Helen, um, your service is about providing information I mean, and you've, You've already indicated that perhaps people aren't getting all the information they need. I mean, what, what, what more can be done, do you think, in this sort of way? I think consistency across the kind of the GP sector would help in terms of the information and the signposting that people receive as soon as yeah. they get that diagnosis. There's lots of useful organisations, charities, bodies out there 
but the problem is there's so much information that can be incredibly overwhelming at the same time. Um, if you're left alone to your own devices and you're not too sure what the type of dementia is, the, the stages, you know, the, the, the life expectancy, you can go online and be completely overwhelmed and, and scared by what, what's ahead of you. Um, so I think what we need to do is try and centralise that information and centralise but also localise it so you can have consistent information that takes you on that journey of for the different paths of dementia but also then signpost to local support and an age space we're trying to do that on a national and regional level but it's really about bringing the different people together so you know people like us are talking to the GPs so the GPs are referring to age space or to age UK and, it, and it's bringing that all together rather than everyone working in silos and repeating themselves wasting money it, it's about bringing it together and, and nationally trying to better educate people about dementia and, and, and what that outlook is for people who have a diagnosis. Thank you, yeah. I saw Michael was nodding uh, firmly there in several places. I wonder how that affects your side, Michael, this, this question of getting the public on board and getting people educated. Well, I completely agree with uh, with everything that, that Helen has just said. Um, education is, is, is essential. It's um, I, it, it surprises me that as a, the general public knows so little about dementia when it, when it is such a, a staggering problem. Um, I think the other issue to, to be discussed is, is that, you know, not uh, mild cognitive impairments. It's not just, you know, one day we wake up and we have dementia. It's uh, th th there's a process one goes through before that diagnosis of of dementia, and I think it's really important that we that we have strong connections with our parents and and elder people with whom we are are, are close. I always I use myself as an example. Um, my parents live in Canada, and I don't get home very frequently. Um, I see really big changes in my parents when I do see them. You know, every two or three years when I go home, and my siblings don't see it. So those small changes that are happening um, right in front of your right right in front of your eyes that you might not pick up on, um, I think become very very important in in getting those early warning signs. And of course, the early we know that there might be a cognitive problem, the more options there are for treating. So I think I think awareness of of, of this issue is really important. Yeah, it's funny that you know. Dementia is so prevalent um, and, and like Michael said, and nobody, you know, the awareness is so low, but when you look at other diseases like cancer and how the media and, and the government have got behind these diseases and, and really raised awareness, AIDS, which has obviously come back into the forefront for the media um, recently, you know, that's again got loads of attention and um, I just, it hasn't happened for dementia yet. And I, I don't know why, you know, maybe it's, COVID, maybe it's, you know, it's happening next year, but there needs to be a plan to take it to that next level and, and, and raise more awareness and educate people. You know, I wonder whether that's because it's a later life condition. So in, in view of that, you know, although we've got an aging population, you know, younger people do outweigh older people at the moment. And so therefore attention goes, goes elsewhere. It's a sort of future problem for the for the people who are currently working in posts, you know, in, in politics and in councils and things like that. But I think, you know, it, for, for us as a sort of society in view of a known ageing population, you know, it's something that's been happening for years, it's not going to go away. You know, living well in later life has got to be a key thing on the agenda, the, the if you like, the green paper on, the, on care and a reform of that. You know, yes, it was in the Queen's speech, but we've waited a long while for that. And I think health and social care as a subject is a feels a bit like an uncontrollable beast. And but somehow we've got to get control of it because, you know, all of our futures depend on it. Dan, um, I mean, you've recently, as we said in the introduction, um, realigned the approach of HUK to provide greater flexibility. I wonder how you're finding that's working. Yeah, I think um, COVID has sort of shown us how um, 
you know, and over, over time as well, that, you know, everyone is an individual and everyone's story is different. And, and often the, the NHS as a, as a model, you know, puts people through pathways and, you know, often those pathways are predefined and set. Actually, you know, as, as humans and as people, you know, things don't work out like that. And I think we, we flexed our model to be, if you like, as, as holistic as we possibly can do. So once we get a call from someone to say, you know, I've just been diagnosed with dementia and I've, I've not had anything from my GP, we will just start having a conversation with that family. We'll understand what they know, where they are in, in view of, you know, perhaps the care requirements or um, activity levels or where they are connected to services and then take it from there really and have that sort of person-centered approach uh, and be in it for the long conversation and the long relationship with them rather than you know um, lots of things you know you get two weeks worth of support and then you're out of the system and I think for a complex condition like this and also probably at that age you're also got other conditions as well to make your life even more complicated I think having that continuation of a conversation with someone is is more of a healthy approach and, and that's why we redesigned our service at our Marion daycare just to do that so what we're finding is if we've got one family who's saying can you come around our house to do you know cognitive stimulation therapy then the next family they just want care and support for friending and then the next family they want a little bit of physical health intervention to keep um, you know their their um, husband wife you know physically active so we're trying to do that within the home environment to keep people independent at home for as long as we can do. So to some extent we're saying that there's some um, gaps in what's being offered by the NHS at the moment or by the statutory services. I'm, I'm t getting that from, from what you're saying. Yeah, I, I think at the minute the often it's crisis support which yeah. is provided at statutory and you know they're they're in that cycle and, and it's not just within dementia it's other services as well so i think that you know the recovery of covid and moving to a more prevention based model is a challenge you know it's something we've got to do to manage all ages and all populations and um we see a lot of it you can only get the support at crisis and often that's too late you could have done a lot more with the family to help them live well if you just start to see them you know two three five ten years earlier so um you know you, you see that a lot around you know the obesity question about you're getting the support of the point someone's requiring a major intervention to keep them alive basically rather than the 20 years before maybe you need to do the intervention i wonder how you feel about that michael from your perspective uh, do you feel that there are things not being done by the statutory services, which would... Um... No, I, I, I do. Um, yeah. I, I absolutely do. Um, if there's anything good that's come from COVID, it is that we can, we can communicate with each other through video, for example. I think we needed to be doing a whole lot more than that. Now, that doesn't replace face-to-face -face conversations, especially in... Um, you know, cases where people are, are aging and they're having um, difficulty with their, with their cognitive health. We need to keep that in mind. Uh, the other aspect that, that Dan talked about is prevention. I think that's really, really important. Um, there are a lot of things that, that we could be doing as a society to improve our general health, um, uh, eating better, keeping ourselves hydrated, uh, getting physical exercise. All of those things are really important for um, relieving some of the conditions of, of, um, of mild cognitive impairments um, and, and dementias. Um, I think another really important thing that we don't do that I think we should be doing is, is more regular testing of cognitive health. Um, we get an eye test every two years, but nobody actually looks at testing our cognitive health um, at, at, at any frequency. Um, and so, unfortunately, sometimes we detect these problems far too late and, and there are fewer treatment options. And what, one thing you, I know you have emphasized it 
as Dan has already, is um, staying active. Um, I mean, in, just in terms of uh, the, the public hearing that, um, what, uh, what are we talking about? Are we talking about people running marathons, doing weight training or? What, no, what? not at all. The, the, just the, the, the recommended um, daily activity that, uh, that, that the NHS advises is, advises is really good. So that works out to um, 150 minutes of, of moderate exercise per week. Um, in, in combination with some, a little bit of strength tart training, maybe two days a week. That alone just, and, and you know, the, the, the sad fact that is, is that the, the vast majority of people um, in the Western world just don't get even that minimal amount of, of exercise. But we yeah. know that, the, that, that, that exercise alone is, as, does, does a lot for brain health. Um, it does a lot for one's neuroplasticity. It does a lot to prevent some of the effects of neurodegeneration or, or, or aging. Um, diet as well, does it, does yeah. having the proper diet does a lot for, um, for, for the brain. Those two things together in combination, it turns out actually do much more than, than just exercise or diet alone. And is that something that age space can get involved in um, Helen and then as it were pointing uh, people towards it. As a resource we, we have a whole section on dementia and we take people through the journey you know from diagnosis to the stage of the dementia and we do wraparound content you know things that you can do to prevent dementia things that you can do with as a family if you have a member with dementia um, you know cognitive skills music therapy so what we try and do is lay out as much help and support as possible um, but I think with all these things, like the great stuff that Marion's doing and Age UK, and, and we know that exercise and diet helps your mental health as well as your, your physical health. But does everyone else know it? And this is the thing, you know, I just, there was a, I remember when my kids were young, there was the five a day campaign, you know, the children must eat five vegetables a day, fruit and veg a day. It was huge. It was everywhere. It was it was it went through schools, it went through supermarkets, it was across the media. You know, this was a huge campaign. And, and again, it's something like that needs to be done. And I, you know, I appreciate what Dan says. It, it, it's not on people's agenda because it is about later life and, and people aren't thinking about it now. But that's where we've got to work is to raise awareness around those kind of prevention um, activities and things that we can do and and you know we have a great resource with age space age uk have some amazing um, resources helping people in in the real person but people just don't know about it they still go to the gp and they walk away bewildered and they don't know what to do and i think you know there's two things there's the prevention but then there's the support after diagnosis and it's about giving people the access so they know where to go so are you saying this message needs to come across at a national level? Yeah, absolutely. I think it needs to be national and I think it needs to be local. It needs to be channeled through, you know, all the sectors. It needs to be channeled through work, schools, um, corporate. It, it, it needs to be a kind of massive integrated campaign that, that on the, the media need to get behind this. I think, you know, ridiculously when, what was it, the football, when they were going to create another Champions League, the, ma the amount of media attention that meant that, you know, the prime minister had to get involved. You know, this is about football. <laughs> and it was just like, we can't do it. We try to do it, you know, between us, between the charity and the information and, and, and all the different bodies, we try to do it, but we can't. We're kind of little voices shouting around and, and we need help to bring it all together. Um, and I think that kind of relies on government and media to help us do that. And I would, I would add to that, yes. sorry, sorry, go ahead. Go for it, Michael, yeah. I was just going to say, I, I would add to that and say, you, you um, Helen, you touched on something really important and that is the workplace. I think we can be doing a lot more uh, in the workplace to promote physical activity and, and, and just well-being in, in, in general, having a healthy lifestyle in general. Unfortunately, I think what happens is that we, we, we teach this to our children our, our children get a lot of physical activity in school. It's a big component of, of what we do in the university. I, I get all of my students, I'm constantly telling them they should be joining sports clubs, they should be going to the gym. They, you know, when they're stressed, 
they should be getting exercise, but then they leave the university or they leave school, they get into the, the, the daily habit of work in the workplace and they forget all about diet and exercise. That just becomes harder to do. I am a, a very big proponent of um, workplace exercise schemes, workplace uh, well-being type, type schemes so that we don't lose this in our late 20s and our, and our 30s, so that we maintain that, that you know, a proper healthy lifestyle. Um, I think that's absolutely critical in, in, in changing our current culture. I think there's, um, it depends on sort of the workplace culture, doesn't it? And I actually went to an event with Age UK a couple of years ago, and um, it was with the Alzheimer's Society, and they'd put a policy in that you had to leave your desk at lunchtime. So you had to go and have a walk, basically, you had to leave, which I thought was brilliant, so simple. But that was the point of that was prevention. You know, they're, they're trying to get people to to exercise. And that's one of their prevention things was if you can just get up and exercise at lunchtime, it's something within. But the work culture needs to support that. I'm really sorry, I've got someone at the door <laughs> and my dogs are going mad. Can I just press mute and disappear for two? Of course. Yeah, there's a bit I'd like to add on if I may. So I think the um, sort of, you know, echo both Helen and Michael's comments about, you know, that word culture. And I think, um, you know, we're not the only country probably who don't have a very good relationship with physical activity. But that also, you know, is, um, you know as a society, we've probably become more isolated over the last 10, 15 years, 20 years, maybe even longer. And I think maybe as time we need a bit of self-reflection to look at you know what is going on in society um what is connected to some of those patterns so that the lack of activity has contributed to maybe a more overweight and obese society you know are we seeing more people who are lonely and isolated because of um, the way we work or maybe the development of social media and, and being able to work more separately from each other and then you know how do we combat those things we've got to work even more harder to reverse the damage if you like and, and I think what we see is you know um, as a charity we're trying to give um, people opportunity to engage with physical activity or, or you know getting people connected to each other in a face-to-face -face or digital environment. But I think there is a lack of opportunity for many people it's through, can't get there because of transport, it's too expensive. Um, and I think, you know, my own, this is only my own personal experience, but through, through my children, you know, opportunity for sport at school has reduced in comparison to what I had in, in my time at school. So, you know, are we starting another generation of people disengaged with sport who don't have an opportunity for a local club uh, because there isn't a community centre anymore and so this is sort of a very complex problem that needs to be looked at you know as a big cultural problem but could probably benefit lots of things around you know we have a big frailty problem in Norfolk well that's probably because people aren't moving around a lot and you know they're, they're not as fit as they possibly could be so there's that mixture of what can society do? What can the system do? But also, what can we all do as individuals to take that self-care approach and and not push the problem? You know, 25 years down the road, really. Um, there are a lot of the key messages that our, our health campaigns will look at around what can what can you do as an individual? Small steps, big change, and you know, um, it's difficult and it's hard, but you know, we've got to do it for for our own healthy later life. So what I'm picking up from what you're saying, what you're all saying is that perhaps we need to, when we're tackling dementia, we need to start earlier in people's lives than is often imagined. So school football and, and workplace. Yeah, I don't think it would hurt for dementia to be put on the curriculum. You know, I know that things like menopause is now being put on the curriculum for, for younger adults. So I don't think it would hurt to start raising awareness and, and you know, talking about prevention, um, you know, because unfortunately, I guess genes is a, is, a, is a big factor in dementia for certain types of dementia. So for some people, you know, they should be made aware earlier and, and you know, start on that path of prevention and 
but it's part of the bigger picture isn't it about healthy aging all the things we're talking about to help with dementia is is, is helping with heart health bone health you know everything it, it's it's all together is about having a healthier lifestyle yeah, but, I was... sorry i was just going to say it's about for older people it's about making um accessibility so they can have a healthier lifestyle um so it's about making things like you know the fitbit trackers that we wear that you know i even struggle to see sometimes now you know it's about making things like this where people can older people can establish routines and, and track what they're doing but making these gadgets accessible for them in terms of kind of the size and the buttons and and how complicated they are to use and I think, um, you know, I see our education system as preparing people for adulthood and, you know, the skills and uh, knowledge we need in, in the country. And I think health is the sort of a, a bolt on rather than a fundamental element of it. So we, we in my, you know, my humble opinion should be looking at, you know, lifelong learning around um, health and education, food, diet. Um, loneliness, connecting people, risks around, you know, certain behaviours increase your risk for lots of things. And I think lots of people don't know those risks. You know, when we take smoking, you know, there was a massive amount of money and huge campaigns around, if you smoke, this is happening to you. But we don't have that on a you know, two litre bottle of fizzy pop. We don't have that type of messaging around some of those behaviours which are destructive to you as a, you know to your health so I think we probably need to get a bit more a bit more serious and a bit more challenging about how we educate people of all ages and continue that education as new things like you know, Michael's research will hopefully one day come out with a you know great um, cure for dementia but that's happening with other conditions and that learning needs to hit the general public constantly to sort of keep them appraised of what their behaviours are doing and how they can you know, look after themselves. So a particular aspect of um, prevention, um, starting early on, I, I know, uh, Michael, is uh, your work with the SCORES project, heading up the SCORES project, um, which was we briefly mentioned in the introduction, which is looking at the long-term effects of heading a ball and its links to dementia in footballers. Um, this issue is obviously quite a hot topic at the moment with Chris Sutton saying he thinks it should be treated as an industrial injury and so I was wondering what how that's going in particular I was wondering um what is it what is it how does it translate to the general public what how can we um apply what you're learning to how the general public act sure I maybe I should start with a little bit of explaining what scores is um the the project has been in the media quite quite frequently, but I know not everybody knows what it is. And, and when it is in the media, we're always talking about former professional footballers, which is great, um, but that's not all that, that we're doing. We're, we're, what we're looking at is what is the effect of contact sport on brain health? So it's not just football, it's also you know people playing sports like rugby. It's not just men. Um, most of the research in, in, in my area, exclusively done on men. So we're actually looking at both women and, and men, but it's a critical part of our study. Um, and we're, we're, we're not just looking at the professional, former professional athletes. We want to know, for example, does playing contact sport at a recreational level, does, does that have any effect on, on long-term brain health? So the way we do it is, is really easy. Um, we, we're doing online testing. I, I spoke a few minutes ago about the, the importance of, of um, doing some sort of an assessment more regularly. So that's exactly what we do. Every three months, we ask people to go to our website. They can um, th they do a set of, of cognitive tests and we score them. Now, it's not like these apps that you might find on your phone that, that you know, allows you to test your brain health. That's just an algorithm. What, in our study, we have real people looking at the data, actually making an assessment. Um, we do that every three months, and then the idea is we track people's cognitive health. So we are we're looking for men and women over the age of 40 who do not currently have a diagnosis of dementia um, and who have been active 
for most of their lives. And we'll, the, the idea is to compare these, uh, the, 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 the professional athletes with recreational level, compare men versus women, and of course, comparing um, um, contact sport versus non-contact non sport. So anybody can join us. The, the website is scoresproject.org. And my, my hope with research like this is that the, these cognitive tests will be available in much the same way that we have an eye test. Every couple of years, we would actually do a, a cognitive test. Is that suggesting that there might be ways we should be changing how sport is taught and practiced to, for children? Well, particularly for children. So I am one of the people that is a, that is a big proponent of, of not having heading footballs in, uh, in young children. And the reason for that is that their brains are still forming. And, and with, with very young children, this, they don't have the same neuroprotective elements in the brain as does an adult. Um, the, the, there are a number of reasons for, for why we're suggesting this, but the, the neurodegeneration that we see later in life probably has very little to do with the number of concussions that one has had. And it has a lot more to do with the number of sub, what we call subconcussive insults to the brain. So each time one heads the ball, there's a little bit of damage. And by doing that over and over again, over the, over the period of many years, that damage adds up and, and, and ends up in neurodegeneration. Now we know that this is a problem for professional footballers. We know it's a problem for, for former professional rugby athletes. We don't know if this is the same in, I should have said men as well. We don't know that this is the same in women. We expect it is, but we, we don't know if it's the same at amateur level and at the recreation level. And that's why projects like the Scores Project, I think it's so important. Thank you. Signed up, Michael. Yeah, oh, brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, I mean, this this is a very important approach. Um, but and then this, but the scores work notwithstanding. I know we're all saying that um, sport, in some sense, is a positive in in our lives. And I know that um, particularly the, the summer campaign that um, HUK is starting is about, as we've already mentioned, trying to help people get active, trying to enjoy getting active, particularly after the COVID lockdown. And what seems to be coming across to me is that it may be a question of people taking quite small steps. Um, Dan, how do you see that? I think? Yes, um, you know, for, for years we, we've worked with say people who have been at, the, you know, at home on their own and through our sort of acti activity befriending we slowly, if you like, introduce um, support to help someone build up confidence to even leave the home. So there's, there's certain people out there who need that hand holding to re-engage them with their local area. So yeah, we're not talking to people going to the gyms, we're talking about people going for a walk around their you know, garden or the block or the go to the cat, local cafe and back. And I think um, our, our campaign is, is, is got you know, a strong presence around sport, but it's also about connecting people. It's also about other activities which people can do to keep their brain active, learn new languages, you know, connecting them to whatever is going on in their local area, which is why I sort of talked earlier about, you know, trying to increase the opportunities for people to do things and for that to become culturally the norm, if you like. And I think, um, you know, people's later life should be the time where they can have a massive amount of opportunities to, to sort of enjoy life. And um, you know, we try to make sure that we, we put those opportunities out there to connect people to younger generations again through our intergen work. But, so, yeah, this campaign's about, you know, small steps, big difference. So, you know, doing, doing a bit more physical health. And that can be very small things, you know, just walk them to the shop one day a week. You might drive there five days a week, but just try and reintroduce that as a positive change. Um, or it could be to, to join a local activity in your, your area, um, try a new sport or activity you've never done before. Um, so you're learning something new, but also you're meeting new people. So for, for that loneliness challenge we've got, you know, it's increasing someone's support network when you know, life, you know, 
challenges you again, you've got people you know around you in your local area who can support and help you. So yeah, really big thing about people perhaps thinking about what sort of life they would like to have and if they want some inspiration, you know, we're there as a charity to sort of help and guide and support them through that. And uh, I mean, Helen, on that, um, what, sometimes, what I sometimes find myself wondering is whether some people just don't believe that small steps can make a difference to their lives. I mean, um, I think there's a couple of really positive things that have come out of lockdown and, and COVID, and that is that people have um, kind of refocused what's important. And because everything was taken away, suddenly those things that we could do, like walking, became a huge source of enjoyment every day. And that was across generations. The other thing that happened was that people started talking more, communities started talking, neighbors started talking more, which opened up the world for a lot of these sort of lonely uh, older people. Suddenly, you know, people are on the street, knocking on their door, checking that they're okay, you know, do they need shopping? So those two things are real positives that have come out of it. And I think we can continue to capitalize on that because it is like Dan says, it is just about a short walk, which you can do every day. Um, and I think everyone felt the need to try and because our worlds were shifted greatly to have some kind of routine. And I think it's about trying to reinforce that routine in life that, you know, a 10 minute walk or a 10 minute online exercise session. We know that older people have embraced technology over lockdown. I know there will be some people who still haven't, but there are a huge amount of people who have. So, you know, the likes of Joe Wicks doing his old um, classes specifically designed for older people. That's fantastic. And, you know, more of that type of stuff that is, is targeted at the older generation um, is brilliant. And it is about just those small steps and, you know, 10 minutes a day. I know myself, I couldn't go to the gym every day or every other day. So I just started doing 10 minutes a day, you know, and, and, and suddenly actually that felt more <laughs> easier than trying to get to the gym. So it is about how you position it. And it's, you know, if it's, if you're trying to fill time as well, having those little routines is a great way of doing that. Um, so yeah, I think it is small steps. Uh, and, and it is small steps, big difference, which is, you know, it's been used a lot, but it is, you will have the impact, you will feel the difference. Again, I can see you nodding on that, Michael. Uh, that's... No, I, I completely agree. One of the things that Helen and Dan have both touched on is this notion of social connectivity. And, and we know that's actually really important for brain health as well. It's, um, um, it's one, one of the key messages I teach to my students in the um, in our in our brain neuroplasticity lectures, it's it, it, social connect connectivity is, is one of the, the the key issues. So you know maintaining that I think is really important. And doing little step as Helen was saying, little steps is 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 really important to, to get into exercise. If we if we've come from maybe a um, a few years or a few decades of not doing physical activity, doing something is better than doing nothing. I was, I mean, I was really, really pleased to to log on to the Age UK site the other day and see that you've now got a, a walking club or a, a walking football club. That's brilliant. That those types of things, that I mean, that just does it all. It um, you don't have to run. Um, um, you know, it's paced at a at a at, 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 a, at, a, at a level that that anybody could do it. Um, to get to the social connectivity, it's absolutely brilliant. Yeah, yeah. I think more gyms and leisure centres need to think about that and how they're how they're pitching. You know, there is a lot of money in the later life market. So if they get it right, you know, there will be people who are still physically able who want to do these things, but they won't do it the way it's being presented at the moment because they don't want to be running at a speed. They don't want to be in a gym full of people you know, with heavy weights or whatever, you know, it needs to be done within the, that's comforting and in a, in a, makes them feel confident in what they're doing. Um, so that's another way, I guess, you know, that, that things could shift and be more inclusive for older people. Dan, I know you've been using um, videos, um, particularly during COVID, uh, HUK has been using videos to encourage people to exercise at home via Zoom, is that too? 
yeah, that's been fantastic. But you know, over COVID, um, we've we support people who actually weren't online by putting the same online content onto DVDs and dispatching them to people. And we got some great results back about, about people who have been doing no exercise, suddenly doing our DVD and, you know, doing those small steps. We do it every day of the week, you know, which is absolutely fantastic. And I think what we see a lot of is even, even someone who perhaps has you know, been doing no physical activity, or has, has deconditioned a bit, the sort of journey of just joining one club can then mean in a year's time, you're suddenly a member of five clubs. You know, we see people go from our table tennis club to then going, oh, I'll also go to the, the 10 pin bowling one because Barry's there and I want to go with him. And, you know, so it, it just really explodes the support network for people. So they can have a great time, but they're also getting that connection health you know um, benefit and, and also just gives them structure to, to their life and things and I think for some people that's doing something like I know Pete you, 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 you're one who learns many languages you know that's a that must be an extreme challenge it's hard work but great satisfaction and I think it's about people finding that thing that they're passionate about which is why as a charity we try to um, you know, have a, have a diverse range of things. So later this year, we're hopefully going to be starting a, a fishing group, you know, to get some people out of Norwich into the countryside to do something, you know, a slightly bit different, a different experience, something probably in the wildlife, which has got great, you know, results in view of, you know, health and well-being. And, and yeah, that's another way that someone can, you know, get supported by AGP Norwich. And well, some of these groups, because I know um, Age UK do some great groups for people with dementia, but some of these sort of activity groups like the fishing and walking, are they open to people with dementia and their carers or can they be, are they a form of respite for, for carers who can sort of drop off so and so and, and they can sort of go away and do something while the person with dementia is engaged with an activity? Uh, you know, whenever we create a group, we always try to make sure it's as inclusive as possible. And so walking football, you know, definitely. Um, and we're actually looking to see whether or not we can um, make it part of our still on the ball club, which is about football reminiscence, about can we take the people who are doing just reminiscence into also doing the playing part as well. So, you know, the hot, they get the mixture, you know, and that's uh, slightly less intense than maybe some of the other groups. but. No, definitely. You know, we, we would expect fishing would equally be a, you know, very inclusive activity for anybody to try of any sort of medical condition or, or, um, or gender. You know, it's uh, open to all. And I mean, we're, we're touching there on the area of, of the carers, um, which we haven't spoken so much about up to now. I mean, I know that um, one of the things Michael emphasises is uh, things like learning to recognise signs of concussion, for example. I wonder, Michael, what, what, what role do you think um, sort of carers have in, in helping with this process? I think really important to recognise these, these signs of mild cognitive impairments, for sure. Um, by the time someone has a, a, a carer, um, un, un, unless it's a carer for a physical ailment, they, 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 they've probably already got dementia. But recognizing um, signs of, of, of big change, signs of distress, um, uh, that's really important. It needs to be reported back to, uh, to GPs and family members. And uh, in terms of carers, what, what is the approach of HUK? Um, Dan, are you focusing on them particularly? Or? Um, we're focusing on families and, you know, and relationships. And I think, you know, there's, there is always that um, some people don't like to be recognised as a carer. They, they, they identify as a husband, wife, daughter or son or, or, or something else. And I think, you know, it, it is important to keep the health of the person responsible or part of someone's care as, as healthy as possible. So all the things we've talked about already today, you know, the, the physical and mental health of the carer is, you know, fundamental to the care of that other person. And I think it's, it's even more challenging. We, we've done some projects in the past where we wanted to, if you like, provide additional support to 
couples around uh, giving them some respite opportunity to take part in exercise and what came out of that was you know feedback that you know my 100% of my thoughts go to my loved one you know their own health physical and mental is sort of in one way just put on the shelf and and bypassed which uh, you know obviously it's not a great situation so I think you know touching on what Helen said about you know gyms and other institutions about creating the opportunities and environments for people to feel comfortable to go into to experience whether that's a cafe or, or whether that's you know a, a gym you know that's what you know dementia friendly Norwich is all about um, it's about people understanding and recognizing um, that someone could have a mental health condition dementia or otherwise and being you know supportive of that and you know for the city and all of its things to feel inclusive of people with dementia and other conditions uh, so I think that's a, that's still a big challenge you know we've made some good progress in that area but you know we've got a long way to go and I think our physical environment and our physical space is probably one of the hardest things but also one of the most important things. Yeah, yeah so I was going to say is that a big part of what you're doing yeah. with Age Space? Massively. I mean, age space is all about helping the families take care of elderly relatives. That, that's, that's kind of our ethos. Um, and I think there's a couple of things that Dan touched on. You know, first of all, people don't see themselves as carers um, because they are a husband or a wife. And they always did that. They always, this will be generational, but they always got their husband's clothes out and, and as such. So um, there's, a, there's a journey there in understanding um, their relationship and how that changes over the course of dementia um, and and also getting to that point where they know that they need help and that they can't do it anymore um, because a lot of people and again I think this is generational hopefully as awareness um, improves around dementia it won't be so hidden you know it's a hidden disease so I know from, from our experience that my mother-in-law you know, we'd go in once or twice a week, touching on what Michael said, we wouldn't notice, we knew that Keith had dementia, but we wouldn't notice the big changes. And it wasn't until she had a stroke and had to go into hospital and we had to take care of him that we were just blown away. And it's nobody's fault, but Anne had hidden that from, she'd protected us because that was her role. That's her role as a mother is to protect her, even if they're, you know, 50 year old children, she carried on doing that. So. I think there's a lot of work around enabling the carer just to know when enough is enough. Um, I think this week, Alzheimer's, because it is Dementia Action Week, the Alzheimer's Society have, have launched their Cure the, Cure the Care System petition. And they've put out a short film, which is incredibly powerful about the carer. It's not about the person with dementia, it's about the carer. And I think this is the cruel thing about the disease that certainly from our personal experience, that once that person has crossed the border, if you like, and they are gone, it's the family that are struggling because they're, they're literally, they, they're still, a, they're grieving while someone's alive because they've lost that person, but they're physically still there. So there's a lot of work that needs to be done around the support for carers. And whether that's in the workplace, in terms of flexible working, um, groups, communities, there's a lot of, there will be opening up again, the dementia friendly cafes, but places where these, where people can go and talk about and share and moan and, you know, express that guilt that they have. And I think Age Space has a forum where we see a lot of people talking and, and you know, they're angry. There's a lot of emotions that come with dementia. Um, so I think that support for the carer is incredibly important. And again, that goes back to what we were talking about at the beginning about information and knowledge and, and knowing what that journey is and, and, and when to kind of step away from it and, and when to get help. Yeah, I, I think um, sort of like I touched on earlier about having a bit of a slightly different non-pathway approach, really. I think, you know, there, there is that point where you're worried about something. You might not have a diagnosis, but you're worried about something. So, you know, where do you go to get that type of information? And often it might be you'd have that conversation with your GP initially, um, or it might be a charity like Age UK or, or, or Age Space. So I think people are now in a world where they, they can you know, self find information out using the internet and things like that. But that's, that can be a dangerous place. So I think 
people knowing where the right place to go is just to have that conversation and I think that's what we see a lot is missing it's um, being able to talk to someone about it you know and to have that um, I suppose exploratory conversation about what the future might hold how did you deal with it and sort of recognize your own story in the life of someone else's story you know, which is incredibly sort of powerful but I think you know you might live well with dementia say 15, for 15 years and then you then need a different type of support but it's like how do we stay in touch with that person as a system a society for 15 years to make sure that they say not doing what Helen just described you know struggling behind the closed doors and you know when there's stuff out there that could help people and help the carer so I think we've got to sort of rethink a little bit about that, that health and social care model yeah. There's a lot of stuff around preparing, to, sorry, as I say, there's a lot of stuff around preparing to care and just looking and putting things in place, like your power of attorney, um, looking into technology enabled care, aids and adaptations and not being on the reactive when these things happen and, and that awareness and knowing what dementia, you know, that journey and what can happen and being able to prepare in advance and financially as well, we know that that is just messed up and, you know, it's a real struggle for people. So um, I think preparing to care is probably one of the biggest things that our generation need to do to get ahead of it. So we're, we're saying this is still quite a hidden problem, perhaps partly for the best reasons in the world, carers are almost helping to hide it because of their protective um, approach, yeah. Yeah, I think um, old age in, in <laughs> is a bit of a taboo <laughs> anyway. People don't want to talk about whether it's dementia and, you know, your, your dad's off wandering or your, you know, where to buy incontinence pants for your mum. You know, these are not discussions that you're going to be having at the dinner table with your friends. It's not like the, the conversations you have around children where it's quite fun and you can, you know, you can talk about it. You just don't do it. And we need to, because otherwise people simply don't know where to buy those incontinence pants or, you know, what to do about if their, their dad's wandering, you know, what, what equipment, what tech can they get that will, would help them? Because we're not talking about it. And this is the part of the problem. So we, we need to have those conversations like we are now and, and, and widen them as much as possible. I think it's about having that conversation and that you know social care is part of that and then, then there is that education piece and you know we've now, we've now got generations where we're strictly looking after children and trying to help look after our parents and, and also you know um, you know older people if you like thinking about how you know they manage their own later life and you know we we reached out to one of our services a couple of years ago and, and it's called the later life planning service because it's not just about retirement and you know the line of retirement is continually moving backwards and what does that mean you know and all, all the sort of traditional assumptions of well you'd own your house by this point and your children would have moved out by this point you know that's all become blurred and you know unique to every family there's, there's no hard lines anymore so you know how, how does the workplace support someone who's who might have their, you know, 30 year old child at home and also their, you know, 90 year old mother. You know, how, how do we adjust as a society for that? And I think we know we've got the, we know statistically that this is gonna happen and it is happening now, but there's a big long lag of us doing quite a lot about it in how we operate as a society, schools, you know, we still start school at exactly the same time as we did probably 50 years ago. You know, the same with we nine to five. We're not really, you know, we all work all over the place at the moment, but there's still some organizations where you have to clock in and clock out like you did probably 20 years ago. That doesn't work when you're caring for someone. And, and yeah. We've got to have that conversation, a mature conversation about all this. I wonder if I can ask um, Michael about one particular thing which I suppose carers and families can be involved in, and I know it's a focus of yours, which is um, um, the importance of accessing and stimulating memory. Um, so presumably that is something every family can do at home with, with, with the confidence and possibly the training. Um, so how much difference can that make 
Well, I think it's I think it's really important. I think that the, the key thing to remember with this is that the the memories are still there in the brain. They're still stored, and and learning the techniques to access those memories. Um, I mean, the, the the part of the brain that 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 um, has the challenges with dementia is 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 the accessing those memories part. The memories are still located in the brain. It's the challenges accessing them. And so then there, there are techniques one can do to, to try to activate those memories. So there are things that we can do. I mean, you, you'll, you'll, a nice example is, is, is something like this. If I asked you to remember um, what you ate for dinner, the food that was on the plate at your last um, anniversary of your wedding, you probably can't tell me the answer. But if I was to give you a smell of, of, of that food, you would remember right away. You would remember not only what you ate, but what room you were in, what was, you know, what was, what was the, the, what were the decorations in the room you were in, et cetera. So those, the, the, the idea is, is that we have these, these triggers that will trigger a memory and then other things come, come flooding in. So there's one thing I think that Age UK is doing that's really nice, and this is the, the, the football memories program. I don't think that's the proper name of it, but it's the, the, the program where you're taking people to Kara Road. And, yeah. and you know, the feedback that, that I'm getting from people that work on the program is, is that it's brilliant. People will sometimes um, remember things that'll, that'll trigger memories um, of, of, of events when they were there, or events that they saw on television. Um, importantly, family events, that, those, those types of things. Yeah, we, we find that that club, yeah, it's called Still on the Ball. Um, so it's, it's amazing how it's not about the football match, it's about the experience of going to the football. So they will even describe, you know, what the name of the burger van, van was on the way and what they had every single time they went on a Saturday, you know, what their child was wearing, where they went after the game, you know, what happened in the, you know, on the way there in the car. And so that, yeah, that story spreads out with football being, you know, a very small part of it at the end. But yes, we talk about all the players and, and things like that, but it's amazing what, as a subject just goes to, yeah, that was the weekend. I missed that match because I got married. And then the story then goes down that road. So, you know, we see that we have another club called Veterans Recall, which is exactly the same thing, you know, they might not be able to say remember what it is yesterday, but they can remember the day they were posted abroad, their army numbers, what all the names of their colleagues were, and what they ate on the first weekend. They were, you know, first in post, and yeah. So I think, you know, through through activities and that connection, you know, it does um, really bring people to life, really, and those memories to life, which are amazingly important to the person, but also the people around them. We often hear the phrase. Oh, my father's come to life since. But it, it definitely echoes back into the home environment after they've been to a club, you know, like ours and other people's. My music is another example. We've got Heather Edwards, who goes around lots of places in Norwich, doing her just singing, you know, people really enjoying that, bringing back some great memories and, you know, wonderful emotions. And, and during lockdown, I saw a lot of videos, of, say someone living with dementia who, suddenly started to perform, you know, ballet again, because they heard Swan Lake and things like that, very emotional and powerful things. And I think there is, there's so much out there, there is so much out there, but it's hard for people to find it. That's the problem. And, and I think this is where, upon diagnosis, if you were given a, a localised pack, whether that's offline or, you know, better online, so the whole family can access it, which has all the kind of educational information, local resources and support, guidance when it comes to kind of legal and financial stuff and the, and the things that you need to prepare as you move forward. Um, and even like you could then integrate care plans into that and, and stuff. So it could become a resource that you, you know, you're joining a club almost, you know, you're joining the dementia club, but you're, you're going in and you've got all the stuff in one place. And that's about connecting all these groups and charities and the government and the CCGs and, and just focusing it. So the, the person and the care and their family 
have this information, which will make that journey better, which will keep them out of hospital, which will save money. And, it, and it's all those things. And it starts with just trying to connect people. And we have the technology to do that. And, and it's just, how do we do it? How do we get people to listen to us? <laughs> Hard, we've been doing it for years, we all have. <laughs> I know, um, I mean, Helen has um, said, she believes um, later life is something to celebrate. And um, I know that's very much the message of, from age, coming from Age UK as, as well, um, the sort of positive message. So I'm just wondering if, um, to, to conclude in a sense, I could ask you, each of you, if you could give us a top tip, if there was one thing people could do to improve their quality of life, what would it, I mean, we've covered a lot of suggestions already, but. What would what would you suggest? Perhaps Michael, you start with yourself. Well, I'll do the easy ones that we always say: um, diet, maintain your diet, maintain yeah. exercise, and if you have the opportunity to do so, um, do cognitive tests, um, assess your mental performance, um, so that you can, so that we can detect. I think early detection is really really important. The early to detect, the more tools there are in the toolbox. To actually do something about it. And Helen? Um, mine would be prepare to care, you know, get ahead of the game. So look at what you want for your, your later life and, and get those things set up in place, whether that's kind of legal, financial, care, you know, have on paper what you want your later life to look like so people can enable that when you get there. Dan? Um, mine would be to invest time in yourself, you know, to take a step back, reflect what you want for your future and invest time in, in, in that future. So you might be 41 and, you know, you might live until you're 89. So that's quite a long while that you might live with, you know, a dodgy knee if you don't sort it out or, you know, a challenging later life if you're not healthy. And, and so, yeah invest time in yourself and give yourself the best chance to love your later life. I have one more actually. Yeah. <laughs> Embrace technology. Embrace technology, yes. Yeah. Embrace technology because there is so much stuff coming out now in terms of kind of technology enabled care that you know we we need to embrace it because it's going to make life a lot easier. Yeah, thank you. And make care better thank you very much so these are i mean these are huge issues and um a lot is clearly being done far more than we've been able to cover in a relatively short discussion today but um i'd just like to thank dr michael gray from uea and helen burgess from age space and dan skipper from age uk for giving us a whistle stop tour of some of the work that is happening and the contact details for those various websites will appear on the screen in just a moment. And thank you all for listening. Thank you. Thank you.